The history of nationalism is bound up with the history of the modern state, which in its most recent iteration is bound up with the history of racism. Here I want to be extremely careful, because the word racism has at least two discernible senses in contemporary discourse. The most common sense is as a reproach. Such and such a statement, or sign, or attitude is quote-unquote racist and an instance of quote-unquote racism. The implication here is that the one accused of being a racist is guilty of the moral failure of bigotry oriented to race. Racists, in this sense, are those who allow their own insecurities and emotional needs to govern how they treat other people, so that if an object of abuse and release is needed, one has such easily to hand by regarding whole categories of bodily description as aggravating factors. The source of all our woe is the presence of the non-white, or the non-Chinese, or the non-black, what have you. And once these are expelled, our pain will resolve. Since our pain never resolves, their continued presence provides a convenient and comforting concreteness to which we may assign responsibility for our frustrations. This understanding of racism is often conflated with a second sense of the word that doesn't necessarily require conscious agents at all, but rather concerns the orientation of institutional structures toward racial divisions. In this sense, an institution is quote-unquote racist, insofar as racial categories are implicated in its operation. So for example, a university, let's say, which privileges access to students from within a certain income bracket, may have the perfectly plausible alibi that it's only consciously motivated by the need to acquire more rather than less money in tuition fees. But if, as a general rule, the income brackets excluded generally follow the contours of race, then that institution may be considered to be quote-unquote racist in orientation, and furthermore to contribute to systemic racism by the ensuing ripple effect of making members of race X have less overall access to post-secondary education with all of the consequences that follow therefrom. This understanding of racism is symmetrical with classism. So for example, the previous example is identical in form to say how a grant aimed to help talented students of marginalized racial categories may privilege members of a specific class by only being made available to students who already had the funding to succeed such that they quote-unquote merited further monetary assistance, whereas lower class students with as much or perhaps even more ability would actually see the most benefit. The institution offering this grant would in effect be classist in orientation. Furthermore, as racist on this understanding denotes an orientation, simply talking about or referencing race, even if the connotations are negative, is not sufficient to classify something as racist in this secondary sense. Race must inform the operation of the thing upon the community, not merely exist as a surface feature. Thus, to conjecture about race, or to suggest race in speech or text, is not in and of itself racist, however often this may overlap with actual racism under the second understanding. It is thus extremely irresponsible to deploy this sense of the word racist as a reproach against individuals. The popular formulation of racism as quote-unquote power plus prejudice, therefore, is little more than a justification for petty abuse, and as far as I am concerned, has no analytic merit whatsoever. So to return to the topic at hand, when I say that the history of the modern state, in its most recent iteration, is largely the history of racism, I am meaning racism in this secondary sense in particular. We'll come back to this later, because to begin with, we first need to answer the questions of what is race, and how did it come to be implicated in the structure of our institutions and even the state. The etymology of the word race is unclear. In his book, The History of the Race Idea, the German political philosopher Eric Vogelin gives a general survey of some candidate etymologies for race, and what he finds is that, while we know with some certainty that it came to the Germans and the English by way of the French, before this it is a mystery whether the root word is Latin, Slavic, Lombard, quote-unquote Old High German, or Arabic. To quote Vogelin directly, we have to be content with knowing that the word is of Southern European origin, appearing at more or less the same time in the late 14th century in Italian and Spanish, from where it migrated to the other European languages. Unquote. 
Now the meaning of the word race has experienced significant transformation since the 14th century. From its earliest usage, the meaning of the word revolved around the fact of descent or origin. Early French examples refer to direct offspring, with one using it to refer to fruits in the botanical sense. It can also refer to a household, for instance in the case of the French royal house, which has been referred to as the premier race. The first English reference occurs in Spencer's poem The Fairy Queen, Book 1, Canto 10, Stanza 60. Quote, and thou, fair imp, sprung out from English race, however now accounted Elfin's son, well worthy dost thy service for her grace to aid a virgin desolate fordone. Unquote. Note that the transition here is from being, quote, sprung out of English race, unquote, to becoming the son of someone else. In German, the word seems to have carried with it a vulgar quality. It is not, in its early use, an endearing choice of word, carrying similar bestial connotations to the English use of the word spawn, which is why Johann Gottfried Herder rejected its use as inappropriate to distinguish man from man. Human societies are not groupings like those of beasts, so the argument goes. When Herder did use the term, it was with apology. Quote, did we walk on all fours like bears and apes? We cannot doubt that the human races, if I may use so ennoble a term, would have their limited fatherland and would never leave it." Unquote. Consistently, race in this early period connotes biological distinctions of specifically particular descent. It had no overlap with any concept of community among rational beings. So that the German doctor Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, concerning his study of facial bones to determine individual descent, gave this disclaimer, quote, Before everything, there is required a warning that in this place there is no discussion of facial expression, taken in the physiognomical sense, to indicate temperament, which itself is never racial and proper to certain nations and is able to be derived from a common source. Unquote. Note the opposition of race to nation. Blumenbach created a racial scheme of classification according to cranial profile, skin tone, the usual suspects we see in racial categorizations today, but what distinguishes Blumenbach from contemporary racialists is that he placed the source of these differences in the environment, believing everything from skull formation to skin tone to be the product of climate, diet, social norms, etc., which is why he could write that, quote, I am of opinion that, after all these numerous instances I have brought together of Negroes of capacity, it would be difficult to mention entire well-known provinces of Europe, from out of which you would not easily expect to obtain offhand such good authors, poets, philosophers, and correspondents of the Paris Academy. And on the other hand, there is no so-called savage nation known under the sun, which has so much distinguished itself by such examples of perfectibility and original capacity for scientific culture, and thereby attached itself so closely to the most civilized nations of the earth as the Negro." Unquote. The 18th century, to quote de Tocqueville, believed in the variety of races, but in the unity of the human species. Unquote. This was to all appearances inevitable because of the assumption, the Christian assumption, underlying all thought concerning race before Darwin, that the strictly human and animal parts of man were autonomous and separate. We were not understood to be a convergence of angel and ape, but an asymptote between them, a quote-unquote in-between creature, as Herder put it, which will one day shed its animal part and unfold its true nature as pure unrestrained spirit. This is why references to human offspring using the word race, at this time at least, had a coarse quality when used in non-scientific discourse, because it emphasized the mechanism of procreation to the exclusion of any nobility inherited from family. Before Darwin, theories concerning the emergence of life were rationalistic, in the sense that organic forms do not emerge as primary phenomena, but come into the world through the tooling or breathing into of life by the deity. To quote Vogelin, the living form is not alive out of the wellsprings of its own vitality, but is a machine put together from the outside, a mechanism, 
The principle of its development does not lie within the living form itself, but rather takes hold of lifeless matter and shapes it mechanically into the apparatus we call animal or plant or man." Unquote. Under this metaphysical frame, to quote from Vogelin again, race speculations of the sort we are familiar with today are still impossible. Unquote. So to account for this monumental shift in how we think about race, we need to close the gap between man's higher nature and his animal one. In Vogelin's terminology, we need to find out how the thought images of organism and finite person gradually grew out of 18th century speculation and culminated in a new, this-worldly idea of man as a unity. What is missing from this account so far is how race comes to be implicated in a political ideology so that we can speak coherently of, quote-unquote, racism, of an institutional orientation toward an understanding of race that implicitly denies the common condition of our species. We've seen how men like Herder and Blumenbach, however condescending their manner may be taken today, regarded the different races inhabiting all continents as equal in terms of their innate capacities to European man. The 18th century, to quote Hannah Arendt, was the time when Chinese paintings were admired and imitated, when one of the most famous works of the century was named Lettres Persan, the Persian Letters, and when travelers' reports were the favorite reading of society." Unquote. French society, in particular, regarded other cultures and peoples even far outside of Europe as containing spiritual and cultural achievements and uniqueness, meriting investigation and sometimes even imitation. This characteristic of French society carried through the revolution, whose message of fraternity spoke to this belief that reason is from all climates. It is in fact out of the ambience of pre-revolutionary France that class thinking and race thinking emerged as twins, being first formalized by the Comte de Belanvilliers in arguments against the rising political power of the third estate, the bourgeoisie. The king, who for a time attempted to consolidate his own status, reframing himself from being the representative of the nobility, the first among peers, to being the representative of France as a singular nation, became at least for a time the greatest defender of the third estate, putting him at odds with the nobility. Boulainvilliers' proposed strategy to reassert the supremacy of the nobility was to deny the common origins of the French people and thereby break up the unity of the nation, undermining the king, consolidate the common identity of the nobility, and presumably force the king to represent the interests of the nobility against those of the third estate. Interestingly, it is the nobility, the Franks, who Boulainvilliers makes out to be the foreigners, conceding that the Gauls, the ancestors of the common folk, had lived on French soil for much longer. The nobility, he argued, hailed from the Netherlands, and they ruled by right of the conqueror. Boulainvilliers' thought was strongly influential among the French nobility, but it was only at the outbreak of the revolution itself that it emerged as a useful political tool, by which the nobility could claim common cause with other continental powers, especially Germany, and indeed another comte, Dubois Nancé, even proposed the creation of a barbarian internationale to look after the common interests of the nobility across different nations. This was racial thinking that identified race with class, and separated mankind not according to physical qualities, but to historic deeds. And it has the merit of not requiring the one who espouses it to depreciate the qualities of the other. Despite some inherent silliness, it therefore retains something of the maturity of certain Greek and Roman writers who are able to recognize the merits of even their greatest enemies. It was fueled by the belief that conquest alone determined the destinies of men. And for everything that was wrong with it, it had the power to inspire. Once in exile, this calmer and more fair-minded conception of race gave way to one driven not to counter a growing threat, but to assuage a deeply instilled bitterness, as the revolution, understood now as an uprising by those who were once a race of slaves, put the lie to the conceit that the best always triumph, at least insofar as the nobility still claimed for itself more than a mere incidental status as nobles. To reiterate, race thinking and nationalism are not only not the same thing, 
They are opposites, with racial divisions originally deployed specifically to abort the growth of nationalism. The race thinking of the French nobility was anti-national in that it asserted the inferiority of the French nation to that of the Germans and the Nordics. German racism, by contrast, was bitter in its crib. It developed in response to the defeat of the Prussian army by revolutionary France as an attempt to unify the German states against Napoleon. Because the threat to Germany was from without rather than from within, as in the case of the rising third estate within the Ancien Regime, the nobility saw their interests aligned with that of the absolute monarch and were able to assert themselves as representatives of the nation as a whole in the same way as the French king once did, and thus had little to fear from the rising bourgeoisie. The politicization of race in Germany developed, therefore, outside of the nobility, and reflected the bitterness of the common person who directly suffered as a consequence of foreign occupation, with the result that German race thinking was purely negative in character, cloaking not the race to which one belonged with nobility, but the other with depravity. Nonetheless, race still tied here not to physical blood, but to a spiritual inheritance. It was only after German unification had already been achieved when race in Germany took on a romantic character among liberal Germans who emphasized an innate German personality that joined the people together and proposed the existence of a true nobility that transcended mere titles, that race began to be deployed internally with the same bitterness against those who, lacking this true nobility, insisted on, or in practice instantiated, unjust disparities in wealth and privilege. So, by the time Darwinism entered the field, race had already been deployed as an ideological tool. The polygenists, for instance, denied any common ancestry between human races, doing much to prevent intermarriage in the colonies. It was deployed in this way as a tool for a very practical reason, even if ultimately it had the result of aborting the possibility of anything we might crown with the title of civilization. The Boers are an illustrative case. Descended from Dutch settlers stationed at the eastern Cape frontier of Africa in the 17th century, they grew with the help of a high birth rate into a small people in their own right, just strong enough to maintain their position against the overwhelming numbers of the native tribes. The word boar means farmer, but curiously enough they came to be defined by an utter contempt for labor and agricultural science. Cut off from the currents of European civilization, and having to deal with extremely bad soil, Boer settlements were spread wide apart and never formed anything like the villages one sees in other European-style settlements, being forced instead into a kind of clan organization, whose only common bond was the constant threat of the African tribes which, like nature itself, always threatened to swallow them up. Lacking any purpose beyond subsistence, Boer society was lazy. It relied on inefficient slave labor to till the land and never did more than what was necessary to keep the household alive, existing at a bare subsistence level. And when the slaves left, the family left. In effect, a wandering horde, rendered ruthless by isolation and superfluous by the capitalist logic of the empire which had no use for such unproductive people, the Boer's identity was grounded not in empire, civilization, manners, or myth, but in blood and skin. Curiously, making them adopt a similar mode of organization to the African tribes whose role they appropriated, becoming just a white tribe among black tribes in precisely the sense despised by Europe. Race thus took on its definitively contemporary sense of a biological category, denuded of history, territory, and culture. In Europe, capitalism affected a similar process of making superfluous large populations of not unjustly resentful men for many of whom race became the only remaining substitute for a political nation. Depending on their temperament, others found this in religion. Capitalism thus becomes inherently implicated in the emergence of race. We can illustrate this by comparing a bell curve to a Pareto curve. Pre-capitalist societies were defined by a politics of exclusion. The rights of Englishmen, the right of kings, the rights of citizens. These had rights, and these did not. The community existed for the good of these, but not for those. All others were servants, outsiders, 
and otherwise did not form coherent communities, but merely populations, and they coexisted with the privileged few who did belong, at least officially, in a merely metabolic capacity. They labored and they served and they produced, but did not of themselves form a class of society, but a mere outgroup. This could be, and overwhelmingly was, a very unfair and cruel arrangement, but everyone had their place and was a part of something. The end of one life was not the end of a whole world, or so they could comfortably imagine. People were embedded in something bigger than themselves that gave them purpose. Hence the late modern obsession with meaning, hence the like of Carlyle. Once trade and industry fall into the hands of private business, whether one is included or excluded from the broader purposes and movements of one's community, becomes not a matter of birthright, of history, of even action or class, but of whether one is useful or not. The citizen ceases to be an end and becomes a means, and when one fails even to become this, they become nothing. An object of complete indifference to the engines of progress, fading into the mass and becoming like phantoms against the standing reserve of nature. Having lost faith in class, in politics, even in the church, which became, in many cases, as indifferent to them as industry, many found no other means of identifying themselves, of making themselves have any sort of real existence except through their race. Darwinism was thus so easily accepted because Charles Darwin's theory of the origin of species by means of natural selection, or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life, folded together the roots of both man and nature in ways already implied by practice. Our formation was no longer understood to be guided by the perfect wisdom of a loving creator, but was a consequence of blind material processes of selection. Furthermore, on the continent, Darwinism added to the principle of inheritance, already accepted as a locus of identity, the political principle of progress inherited by the followers of philosophers like Kant, with the upshot that, to quote Hannah Arendt, the existence of lower races shows clearly that gradual differences alone separate man and beast, and that a powerful struggle for existence dominates all living things." Unquote. Rather than having an angelic nature cradled safely under the watchful eye of God, man had a merely angelic potential that could be attained only by struggle. And once it became apparent that class and race did coincide at least sometimes to a visible degree, this racial struggle came to imply in man an eternal war internal to the species. We've now seen at least the rough contours of the story of how the modern concept of race emerged as distinguishing not simply between different lines of descent, as it did in its earliest recorded usage, but between different kinds within the human species. A critical characteristic of this account is its sheer contingency. The concept of race didn't emerge as the logical conclusion of philosophical thought or science, but as the result of a series of what are at bottom historical and political accidents. Now this is not to say that it would have been impossible for us to happen upon the race concept that we have now, or something very similar if things had happened differently. It is only to say that it was not inevitable that we did happen upon it, and so we can't treat it as natural. This second section will deal with the historical emergence of the concept of nationalism itself. Now there are competing definitions of nationalism, and it's worth briefly considering a few prominent ones. In his 1960 book, Nationalism, Eli Kadowry writes that, quote, Nationalism is a doctrine invented in Europe at the beginning of the 19th century. It pretends to supply a criterion for the determination of the unit of population proper to enjoy a government exclusively its own, for the legitimate exercise of power in the state, and for the right organization of a society of states. Briefly, the doctrine holds that humanity is naturally divided into nations, that nations are known by certain characteristics which can be ascertained, and that the only legitimate type of government is national self-government." Isaiah Berlin, in a 1979 essay entitled Nationalism, Past, Neglect, and Present Power, 
which may today be found published in an essay collection called The Proper Study of Mankind, gave a split definition of nationalism, in which he characterized it first as, quote, the desire to be citizens of a state coterminous with the nation which they regarded as their own, unquote, and also as, quote, the elevation of the interests of the unity and the self-determination of the nation to the status of the supreme value before which all other considerations must, if need be, yield at all times, unquote. Ernest Gellner, in his 1983 book, Nations and Nationalism, writes, quote, Nationalism is primarily a political principle, which holds that the political and the national unit should be congruent. Nationalism as a sentiment, or as a movement, can be best defined in terms of this principle. Nationalist sentiment is the feeling of anger aroused by the violation of the principle, or the feeling of satisfaction aroused by its fulfillment. A nationalist movement is one actuated by a sentiment of this kind. There is a variety of ways in which the nationalist principle can be violated. The political boundary of a given state can fail to include all the members of the appropriate nation, or it can include them all, but also include some foreigners. Or it can fail in both these ways at once, not incorporating all the nationals and yet also including some non-nationals. Or again, a nation may live unmixed with foreigners in a multiplicity of states, so that no single state can claim to be the national one." Unquote. We might also include the analyses offered by books like Eric Hobsbawm's Nations and Nationalism since 1780, and Benedict Anderson's celebrated book, Imagined Communities, Reflections on the Origin and Spread of Nationalism, which, while not offering a definition of nationalism as such, seek to explain it according to roughly similar terms as the aforementioned authors, albeit typically in a structural or an historical way. For the approach I'm going to take in this video, we don't need to reconcile these different understandings of nationalism beyond observing the one obvious common feature that each conceives nationalism to be the congruence of state and nation, of the people understood in ethnological terms with the limits of the political unit, and a unifying thread between every one of the thinkers just mentioned, despite their differences, is a critique of nationalism as a stance on the grounds that either nation or state or both are recent historical developments and that this belays the common nationalist narrative of an historical continuity between the state, its territory, its people, and something like its quote-unquote national character. While its internal logic seems serviceable enough, I don't find this line of argumentation compelling for the reason that it doesn't seem obvious to me that a belief in a historically rooted conception of national character is in fact an essential and inseparable part of being a nationalist. Gellner, for instance, writes that, quote, Nationalism is not the awakening of nations to self-consciousness. It invents nations where they do not exist, unquote. This implies that the nationalist is by default operating under the influence of an historical delusion about the past, but I see no reason why someone couldn't easily adhere to a nationalist stance prospectively, believing it desirable or pragmatic that national and state boundaries should be congruent in an entirely forward-looking way, perhaps, for instance, by way of a belief in the efficacy of eugenics to produce ideal subjects or citizens or otherwise human beings, that could then form a nationally homogeneous state, and that this is to be desired. Furthermore, while this kind of argument aims to account for the intellectual poverty of much nationalist thought, each of these thinkers, Kadauri, Berlin, Gellner, Hobsbawm, and Anderson, may be found upon a closer analysis to be guilty of precisely the same error, however more genteel their expression of it may be than the garden variety nationalists. There is an inherent, and I will argue obscuring, element of condescension in these books. The quintessential example, to my mind, is a sentence from Imagined Communities. Anderson writes, quote, Unlike most other isms, nationalism has never produced its own grand thinkers, no Hobbeses, Tocquevilles, Marxes, or Webers, unquote. But Anderson is quite wrong. Nationalism has certainly produced its own Webers. The most famous, in fact, is Max Weber himself. Quote, Nowadays, we must say that the state is the form of human community that successfully lays claim to the monopoly of legitimate physical violence 
within a particular territory. And this idea of territory is an essential defining feature, unquote. Also earlier, quote, hence what politics means for us is to strive for a share of power or to influence the distribution of power, whether between states or between the groups of people contained within a state, unquote. These lines taken from Weber's lecture, Politics as a Vocation, are famous, but the stress is almost always placed on the part concerning the monopoly of legitimate physical violence, whereas I will argue the crucial part is really that which cites territory as the essential defining feature, for the simple reason that, despite being treated as an appendage to the argument, i.e. as the caveat that its monopoly on legitimate violence must be held within a territory, in the very framing of the state as being capable of holding a monopoly on anything, its territoriality must be presumed. If states are defined by a monopoly of anything, then it follows as a matter of course that by definition two states cannot occupy the same space. As it happens, legitimate physical violence is the only thing over which states have a monopoly in this formulation. It is the means specific to the state and that which gives the state its identity. Hence, quote, if there existed only societies in which violence was unknown as a means, then the concept of the state would disappear, unquote. This territoriality is not simply predicable of the state, however, but also the nation itself, at least in how it's treated. And despite explicitly denying the inherent territoriality of the terms through which they think the nation, Almost every analyst of nationalism that I have encountered, including every thinker we've dealt with so far, has directly and inevitably implied it. A quote from Gellner's book is emblematic. Quote, Not all societies are state-endowed. It immediately follows that the problem of nationalism does not arise for stateless societies. If there is no state, one obviously cannot ask whether or not its boundaries are congruent with the limits of nations. Unquote. This is perfectly consistent with Kadauri's characterization of nationalism as the desire that state and nation be congruous, of Isaiah Berlin's characterization that state and nation should be coterminous, of Benedict Anderson's description of nationalism as imagining the nation to be sovereign, directly conferring it a property appropriate specifically to territorial states. Quote, nations dream of being free, unquote, Anderson writes. And quote, the gauge and emblem of this freedom is the sovereign state. Unquote. It is, in short, a perfectly mundane and acceptable statement, judging by the best received studies of nationalism, but it still begs some rather important questions. If territoriality is specific to the state, and if for those nations that don't have a state, the problem of nationalism therefore does not arise, then how can nations have the kinds of boundaries that are capable of being made congruent with state borders in the first place? For that matter, why do we even think of nations as being the sorts of things that can have boundaries? Consider, even an ethnically homogeneous state would not be bordered by its ethnicity. At most, all that could be achieved is that the denizens of a given state territory and the offices of state authority be extricated of all who are not members of one favored designated national group. Or, as a more modest and realistic alternative, perhaps it would only dared be hoped for that government be oriented specifically toward the good of persons of one particular national description to the exclusion of others. It is really quite absurd that we should imagine nations, which must always to some degree at least exist as a diaspora spread across the globe, and must inhabit the territories of many states at once, and must of necessity exist as varying degrees of genetic concentration as members of different nations endlessly reproduce with one another, as being capable of being circumscribed in such a neat fashion as is implied by the concept of the nation-state. It seems, therefore, that what must differentiate the nation-state from previous state forms is not, in fact, the alignment of national boundaries with state boundaries, but rather the curation by the state of who is allowed to dwell within a given territory and occupy its offices. The mechanism for curating the nationality of a territory's population, of course, is immigration control. The border must be protected. 
keep this in mind as it will come to bear. But moving forward, Weber assumed that territoriality was a defining feature of the state. It was a defining feature because the state, on his view, is defined by a monopoly of legitimate physical violence. And to reiterate, a monopoly necessarily implies a limited space in which that monopoly may be held. But there's a problem in that, while states absolutely exercise power over and within territory, state borders do not actually represent either the minimal or maximal extent of monopolies of legitimate physical violence. I think this is actually fairly common knowledge. In fact, it's as nonsensical to think the state in territorial terms as it is to think the nation that way. And it's not hard to figure out why. The state isn't a substance. The state doesn't coat its territory the way we designate different states on a map by coloring them in. Yellow for Canada, green for the United States. Does their power actually end there? Obviously not. Furthermore, that bit about, quote-unquote, within a territory. What do we make of this, then? I submit that in no time or place in history have the limits of the territory owned by a state constituted a limit to state power, or that power's legitimacy, in fact. The state is a political community. Weber himself admits this. A community is by definition not an unindividuated substance, but an aggregate of individual members. It is a specific and very exclusive form of political community that can be classed alongside other forms of political community like democracy, oligarchy, aristocracy, timocracy, tyranny, and every other community form that may be found in the political writings of ancient philosophers like Plato and Aristotle. And just as none of these implicate territorial extent as a part of their structure, neither does the state. As a community, the state is comprised of those who fill its offices, not the ground upon which it sits, whether these offices be many or few. Hence it is possible to say, l'état c'est moi. State authority is not omnipresent within a territory. It is enacted locally at the same time it is enforced by the people who enact it. It extends internodally between bureaucrats, officers, functionaries, police, etc., and, like a spider's web, between the linear networks of communication that form the sensory apparatus of the state is an overwhelmingly greater area of unmonitored space, blank areas on the map. The nation-state doesn't represent congruency between state borders and national borders, because the nation doesn't properly speaking have borders, but rather it represents the extension of these information-gathering and curating organs, these nodes, to be sensitive to and engage with nationality as a concept, as a category. In all of the accounts of nationalism we've looked at so far, it has been assumed that the territorial state preceded the emergence of nationalism, and that nationalism emerged out of a desire to make national boundaries synchronous with the borders of the already existing territorial state. I am going to argue that this is dead wrong. I am going to argue that every one of the celebrated and distinguished political thinkers I've mentioned here, from Benedict Anderson all the way to Max Weber himself, was wrong. We are very fortunate that the transformations with which we are about to be dealing with all took place amidst a revolution in information acquisition, because I am going to make the historical case that the modern territorial state did not precede nationalism, but in fact acquired its very territoriality by being itself nationalized. And the motive for the nationalization of the state was verifiably, in fact, quite explicitly and deliberately to do with race and racism. In short, nationalism didn't arise because of the territorial state. The territorial state and the modern form of nationalism co-produced each other as the result of recent historical attempts to deal with bizarrely context-specific exigencies surrounding the migration of Indians. Like many bad stories, Ours begins with slavery and ends in Canada. In fact, funnily enough, it ends roughly right where I now sit in British Columbia, 
See, Canadian history is only boring if you think of Canada as its own thing. If you think of it as the frontier of the Empire, it's actually the most interesting place on Earth. The limit produces the center, as we will see. On the 1st of August, 1834, the year after the British Slavery Abolition Act, Britain began a process of gradually weaning its plantations off of the need for slave labor. Emancipated slaves, I don't say former slaves because they still had no say in the matter at this stage, were put under a six-year apprenticeship program, later reduced to four years, during which Britain had to find a suitable source of replacement labor. India then being under the dominion of the British Empire, indentured, meaning contracted, migrant workers from India were seen as a promising alternative to slaves. However, coming as it did right after the abolition of slavery, the system of indenture was met with skepticism, with many arguing that in all but name it amounted to nothing less than a new species of slavery. These arguments weren't groundless. Supposedly, indentured Indian workers made their employment contracts under their own volition as free British subjects, but committees were formed to investigate, and what they found was that the process of labor recruitment was rife with dishonesty and indeed coercion. Indians who couldn't read were outright lied to about the terms of their contracts and the conditions of their work, and then threatened by recruiters and employers to keep quiet about abuses and breaches of contract when they occurred, both legally and corporally. Thus, the indenture system was condemned by most of the committees made out to assess it, but ultimately it was determined to be too economically important by governments to be simply done away with. The solution was to regulate migration. Every Indian who wished to pursue employment under indenture would have to submit an application to the office of a protector who was tasked with verifying that any prospective workers did so freely and understood to some minimal extent what they were signing up for. This doesn't seem so radical to us living today, but among liberal Britons this sparked massive debates about the right of the government to restrict the free movement of British subjects within the empire. It is largely ignored that free mobility forms a central part of much of classical liberal thought. For instance, the Lockean concept of tacit consent, that freely partaking in society and enjoying its benefits and protections constitutes an agreement to abide by its rules, falls apart if one has no choice but to partake in that society. In his second treatise on government, John Locke writes, quote, A child is born a subject of no country or government. He is a free man. At liberty, what government he will put himself under, what body politic he will unite himself to. Unquote. And then concerning adults, quote, When an owner who has given nothing but such tacit consent to the government will, by donation, sale, or otherwise, quit said possession, he is at liberty to go and incorporate himself into any other commonwealth, or to agree with others to begin a new one in vacuous locus in any part of the world they can find free and unpossessed." Unquote. The seriousness with which this was treated should not be underestimated. When liberal Britain regulated free movement to non-militants, as happened in 1792 when the entry of Jacobins was monitored by the state, it was an extraordinary exception, and even this case, where what was being monitored was seen to constitute a serious political threat, it was denounced by liberals as equivalent to a suspension of habeas corpus. Now, the free movement of British subjects, which Indians were, was being restricted in an historically bizarre turn of events for the sake of their own freedom. However, as in the Jacobin case, this was still an exception, and a hotly contentious one at that. This far and no farther was the consensus of even those who agreed to the new restrictions. Nonetheless, pursuant to satiating the desires of liberals to make sure that something akin to slavery wasn't going on, there accrued an unending series of legislations, rules, regulations, annual reports, quarterly returns, routine correspondences, routine memos, routine inquiries, etc., etc., with the result that a massive regime of data acquisition and collation began to form, with an attending regime of mass regulation concerned with matters as wide-ranging and intimate as the proper specifications for the designs of water closets on ships, <laughs> 
to rations for breastfeeding mothers. One of these regulations made it illegal to bind Indians to contracts in India prior to disembarking, so that they could observe the conditions of their prospective workplace for themselves within a 48-hour period after having landed, before they decided whether or not they wished to stay on and sign their contract or to take the voyage back. Bookmark this because it comes critically to bear later on. Inevitably, as these regulations multiplied, so too did the offices responsible for enforcing and reporting on them, with the result that a massive bureaucracy began to form as the nexus of a nodal network of surveillance and examination, with the delineation of key sites of intervention and an increasing systematization of each aspect of migration through the call for meticulous record-keeping to ensure that abuses and injustices, as well as inefficiencies and loopholes, were identified and met appropriately on as many levels as humanly possible. This process of bureaucratic growth was infectious. If rations and contracts and the designs of water closets were implicated by bureaucratic surveillance and regulation, then those agencies responsible for facilitating manufacturing and supplying them, and then in turn every intermediary they interfaced with, had to meet that regulatory structure in turn with regulatory structures of their own. To put it a bit more simply, the largely well-motivated liberal desire that slavery be in fact abolished gave rise to a deep skepticism about the free part in free movement, and thus the bureaucratic hive that defines the state from the late 19th century onward ultimately stems from the liberal call that inquiries into abuses within the indenture system be made so that they can be identified and resolved. The only th problem was is that as more and more abuses came to light with every increase in the resolution of the inquiries, these in turn provoked the call for still further like inquiries and the attendant growth of the bureaucratic apparatus responsible for executing them, causing an explosion in the size of the state. I mention this history for two main reasons. First, to emphasize that border regulations were not the norm, but a rare exception, even as late as the 19th century. The territorially restrictive state is, in historical terms, extremely new. Note that even the case of indentured Indian migration discussed here took place within the territory of the British Empire state, which did not as such curate the makeup of its own population, but limited migration within the Empire State as a matter of internal policing. So our account has so far not yet arrived at the territorially restrictive nation-state, only the technology by which the territorially restrictive nation-state becomes possible. The common narrative, as a brief aside, that the Peace of Westphalia, which is a poorly documented treaty whose terms are largely forgotten, constitutes some decisive moment in the emergence of the modern state form as we have it today, is an unsubstantiated piece of mythology. Again, the nation-state is very recent. Second, while these restrictions were exceptional, the sudden proliferation of quote-unquote Asiatic freemen to the plantation colonies of former slave owners, notably the African colonies, Mauritius and the west coast of Canada, was extremely irritating to their white populations. And this is where racism in the prejudicial sense begins to play a critical role in the emergence of the territorially restrictive nation-state. Again, at the risk of being redundant, recall that migratory restrictions at this stage are limited only to indentured workers. Non-indentured Indians were free to migrate wherever in the empire they wished, and sometimes they became quite well off, engendering in their white neighbors tremendous resentment, because while the liberal-dominated metropole of London was concerned with the freedom of British subjects, which indentured Indian migrants certainly were, plantation owners in Africa and their white employees in the colonies were not, and when in the early 20th century the migration of free Indians began to increase significantly, white colonists began to agitate for closing entry to Indian migrants in particular. However, there was a problem. Liberal British law forbade explicit discrimination amongst its subjects on racial grounds, and so indirect attempts were made to limit the import and growth of non-white populations, again, specifically Indians. Measures like literacy requirements. Head taxes were only 
Those Indians who could afford to pay a certain fee were allowed to emigrate to the colonies for work. This was justified on the grounds that destitute Indians would represent a burden on public funds. These proved ineffective, however, as upper-class Indians would often assist in satisfying the monetary requirements for poor Indians, meaning that wherever free Indian migrants managed to turn a profit, the population of Indians increased despite these efforts to decrease them, a situation quite noxious to those who grounded their sense of identity in their race. One rather interesting strategy for getting around this implicated marriage practices. Indian migrants were permitted to bring with them one spouse. Despite polygamy being extraordinarily rare among Indian migrants, for example, in 1914, with a total population of over 80,000 free, i.e. non-indentured Indians in the African colonies, there were only 40 recorded cases of polygamous marriages. It was ruled effectively that marriages made under religious systems that recognized polygamy were not to be regarded by Christian laws as marriages in fact, making, in effect, Indian wives, in general, the mere concubines of their husbands in the eyes of the empire, and therefore not eligible to come along with them to the colonies. Because indentured migration was strictly gendered, with women not being allowed to apply for work contracts themselves, this had the effect of banning one half of the necessary components for the production of new Indians in the colonies. This use of religious discrimination as a Trojan horse for racial discrimination was not unnoticed by Indians, who by this time were beginning to agitate for their rights as British subjects, and in fact the Satyagraha movement of Mohandas Gandhi would become heavily fixated on the marriage question, considering it a matter of national honor that the wives of Indian men not be degraded as mere consorts. This had the perverse result that the supposedly anti-colonial movement of Indian nationalists reified and concretized the very link between race and religion being deployed by the colonial powers to persecute them. Recall that the primary concern animating the 19th century regulations of indentured Indian migration was to establish criteria by which the migration of indentured Indian labor could be construed as quote-unquote free and thereby guard against charges that indenture was but slavery by another name. Until the early 20th century, the only movement the state monitored, and this only as an exceptional case, was this large-scale movement of indentured Indian labor. In fact, the law only recognized emigration with respect to indentured labor. It was blind to everyone else who traveled unimpeded by governmental restrictions. The measures implemented to limit and deter the immigration of Indians to the African colonies were ridden with legal and political problems. They offended liberal principles of the free movement and autonomy of British subjects, and also majorly contributed to the increasing agitation of Indian nationalists, who, as we now know, would eventually make a successful bid for independence from the empire. The critical turn came with an ingeniously subtle technological development in Canada, of all places. In late 1905, about 2,000 Indian men arrived at Vancouver, an unprecedented number which provoked tremendous anxiety among white British subjects. By 1907, anti-Asiatic leagues orchestrated riots in Bellingham, Washington, and Vancouver against Indians and quote-unquote Asiatics with the ironic result that about 400 Indians migrated away from the U.S. into Canada as refugees following the Bellingham riots in particular. This racial anxiety, as well as undoubtedly an anxiety for public order, is palpable in the desperate objections of the Governor General to the Secretary of State for the Colonies in London via a telegram which read that, quote, The Indian men had doubtless come under misrepresentations they are not suited to the climate, and there is not sufficient field for their employment. Many in danger of becoming public charge and thus subject to deportation under the law of Canada." Unquote. These three points were later increased to five in a memorandum issued by the Government of Canada on the 2nd of November 1906. The memorandum cited climate as the chief reason to restrict movement, but also, quote, the caste system, which is universal among these people, is seriously in the way of their employment, unquote, 
and that, quote, the work for which they are required is necessarily rough and hard, and not of a character for which they are physically fitted, unquote. And the conclusion of the memorandum was therefore that, quote, should the immigration continue, large numbers must become a public charge, in which case they would be subject to deportation under Canadian immigration laws, unquote. Now, despite making no reference to biological race, Notice how culture is deployed here in its stead as an alibi, so that while in fact these statements are contrived specifically to target people of a certain racial description, on paper it is only by sheer coincidence, plausibly, that these cultural descriptions circumference precisely the undesirable racial group. As it happens, all of these points were called out as bogus. As Colonel William Falk Warren, an artillery officer in British Columbia, put it, Quote, there are now between 2,200 and 2,500 Indians in the province of British Columbia, all come from the Punjab. They are mostly Sikhs. None are allowed to land who are destitute, so all have some ready money in hand, some as much as 30 pounds or more. They are a stout and able-bodied set of men. A large proportion are ex-soldiers. Their conduct has been exemplary. I am not aware that a single one has been convicted of any crime, however slight. The fact of their coming to this country shows enterprise and daring of the men, as also their trust in seeking work in countries under the British flag at such a distance from their homes." Unquote. The Canadian government had resorted to arguments based on the unsuitability of the climate, because, consistent with the regulations which granted a 48-hour decision period for newly landed immigrants before signing their contracts, the Indians who arrived in Vancouver were not already under contract, and thus were not indentured, and thus laws pertaining specifically to indentured labor could not be deployed to justify refusing them entry. It is in this ambience that then-Canadian Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier proposed in 1907 two possible candidate immigration-limiting measures for the consideration of the Colonial Office in London and the Government of India. The first of these proposed measures being a $200 monetary requirement, quite steep at the time, which had precedent in that a similar head tax was already placed on Chinese migrants. The second proposed measure was a system of selectively issued passports that met three conditions. One, it was to prohibit Hindus from going to Canada without passports. Two, it was to limit the number of passports issued to a number agreed upon by the governments of Canada and India. And three, the ordinance by which the system was put into place was to require that the government of Canada deport all Hindus arriving at Canadian ports without passports. At the time, these proposals were ill-received by the government of India, not just because the grievances they ostensibly targeted were transparently aimed at race, but because they were severely aggravating to a colonial Indian government threatened by an increasingly anti-colonial, nationalistic, and separatist population. Any measures that could be interpreted by Indians as unfair treatment violating their rights as British subjects and disparaging to Indian national honor would be refused by the government of India which was steadfast in its adherence to the complete freedom of movement of British subjects within the empire. Frustrated, the government of British Columbia deployed a tactic. As a result of the government of Canada's curious position with respect to the riots of the anti-Asiatic leagues, in which it was forced to take in Indian refugees caused by the riots amidst its own active attempts to curtail Indian immigration, Inquiries across the empire were made into every aspect of migration, as well as to infiltrate the anti-Asiatic leagues and determine their support bases and funding. Every ship that sailed was required to give reports on the numbers of Indians aboard and their financial situations, with the result that massive amounts of data on immigration was collected and collated, yielding one crucial piece of information to the authorities and that is that a proportion of Indian migrants to Canada were in fact re-immigrants who had worked in a country other than India and then went to Canada later having heard that greater livelihoods and wealth could be made there. And so in a clever move, an order in council in 1908 read, quote, Immigrants shall be prohibited landing in Canada unless they come from their country of birth or citizenship by continuous journey and on through tickets purchased before starting." Unquote. This order effectively prohibited Indian immigration entire, 
It prohibited Indian re-immigrants because they would never be coming from their country of birth or citizenship, which was India, but from whatever country they had last traveled to for employment. And it also prohibited new immigrants because at the time no steamship company operated a direct transit from any port in India to Canada. Significantly, directly following this continuous journey regulation, a Russian and a Frenchman, well educated and respectively employed as an electrical engineer and a bank clerk, arrived at Vancouver from Japan, obviously not the country of their birth or citizenship. Under the regulation, neither should have been allowed in, and indeed, they would have been deported, but for the intervention of U.S. immigration officials who were, quote-unquote, glad to pass them on into the United States. A secret agent by the name of T.R.E. McKins, in a report to Wilfrid Laurier, stated that he knew, quote, that the regulation was never intended to be enforced in this absurd manner, unquote. This lays bare the rampant interweaving of juridical liberalism and racism that characterizes the early 20th century. While the strategy of the law was racist, because the structure was neutral, the racist intentions of the law could only be observed in those rare moments when legislators cited race specifically. Or, when exceptions are made which favor non-target groups on grounds of race alone. And there was no conceivable absurdity in this case, except for the consistent application of the law when the applicants were white. Racial thinking in the law was at this stage an open secret. In the colonies, racism against Indians was not an entirely unpopular opinion. Rather, it was empire-spanning political issues like Indian nationalism that prompted governments to resort to covert methods for discrimination. Now, administrative law serves to incorporate exceptions to the rules and to shield these decisions from judicial review. Bureaucratic discretion allowed the racist spirit behind the legislation to be enacted without putting it to paper. Combined with a monetary requirement, this continuous journey legislation was actually quite effective, and between 1909 and 1913, only 27 Indians managed to enter Canada. Nonetheless, a passport system was still pursued by the Canadian government, as many employers were found to prefer to employ Sikhs over white men, according to a confidential report by Colonel Swain, the governor of British Honduras, on the grounds that, quote, they can be more safely relied upon to give continuous employment, unquote. There was thus a demand for Indian workers, and the passport system would allow Canada to meet that demand while still only allowing the minimal number of Indian immigrants necessary. This is the genius of the passport system. The number of passports issued can be artificially restricted at will, meaning that the stream of migrants from specific geographical regions can be choked off without explicitly mentioning race, while the logic of bureaucratic discretion allows governments to make exceptions favoring the immigration of desired racial groups allowing for the quite accurate targeting of race without having to commit oneself to avowing a racist stance. The subtlety of this system is that it makes it impossible to prove that race is in fact deliberately being selected for. And today this system has been so naturalized that it is often quite impossible to tell if restrictions are themselves deliberately racially oriented or if the overrepresentation of some racial groups over others isn't merely accidental. In the absence of agents of this system themselves stating that their motivations are racist, which today is extremely unlikely, one can only implicate racism by making uncharitable speculations. But as it happens, in this earlier period, we actually have documents which explicitly cite race as the motive for the implementation of this system. Rather incredibly, Prime Minister Wilfrid Laurier himself said with surprising candor that, quote, the people of Canada want to have a white country, and certain of our fellow subjects who are not of the white race want to come to Canada and be admitted to all the rights of Canadian citizenship. These men have been taught by a certain school of politics that they are the equals of British subjects. Unfortunately, they are brought face to face with the hard facts only when it is too late." Unquote. Nonetheless, the Indian government remained steadfast, 
That is, until two related events centering around the cities of Victoria and Vancouver triggered a radical alteration in the government of India's position. In October 1913, 56 Indians arrived in Victoria aboard the Panama Maru, 17 of which were allowed in on the grounds that an intelligence agent, William Hopkinson, thought he recognized them. The remaining 39 were officially denied entry, but one physically escaped from the holding place where they were being kept prior to deportation, while an additional 36 were ultimately let into the country when the Indian community successfully challenged the decision of the Board of Inquiry of the Immigration Department on the grounds that the wording of the Orders in Council were not consonant with the Immigration Act, and so were void. The remaining four were denied admission on medical grounds, but also managed to escape from the immigration hall, meaning that every one of the 56 migrants had successfully flouted the attempts of the government of British Columbia to halt their entry. Encouraged by this, and by revolutionaries in Canada, a businessman and entrepreneur named Sardar Gurdit Singh hired a ship, the Komagata Maru, to sail from Hong Kong to Vancouver with stops at Shanghai, China, and Japan, gathering 376 passengers. The ship was ultimately turned away without even being allowed to land at Vancouver, and eventually landed at Calcutta where a number of the passengers were killed after resisting when British officers attempted to arrest Singh. But despite its failure, this alarming event was reported in British Columbia papers as part of a mounting Asiatic invasion, and was like a splash of cold water for the Empire, indicating that Stronger measures than the $200 head tax and continuous journey regulation would be needed to effectively limit Indian migration. This provoked an uproar in the Canadian House of Commons and in the Indian government. And whereas before, the Indian government was staunchly against the implementation of a passport system, the very same S.H. Slater of the Government of India, who in 1913 had opposed any restriction on any immigration, seven months later wrote that, quote, Circumstances are now compelling a stricter definition of phrases as membership of the British Empire. It is now conceded that such membership does not carry with it the right of free entry to all parts of the empire. Therefore, in this narrower view, it will no longer be held that every measure of exclusion of Asiatics from territories forming part of the empire is necessarily and ipso facto an injustice to Indians. Unquote. And now, at last, we come to the point of all this. As a direct consequence of the Komagata Maru event, the rationales that organized migration radically changed. The challenge now was to implement migration controls without triggering empire-wide political protest by Indians. And this was accommodated by the passport system, which was now accepted by both the Indian and the Canadian governments. In an interesting turn, the birth of nationalism in its contemporary sense was co-produced by a curious reciprocity between Indian nationalists and white racists who were constrained by the inability of the law to countenance appeals to biological racism and racial superiority. The argument was fielded for the very first time that immigration control was a principle of national sovereignty. Frank Oliver, then Minister of the Interior in Canada, put it thusly, quote, The immigration law as it stands is a declaration on the part of this country that Canada is mistress of her own house and takes the authority and responsibility of deciding who shall be admitted to citizenship and the privileges and rights of citizenship within her borders. This is not a labor question. It is not a racial question. It is a question of national dominance and national existence. This, the Komagata Maru incident, is an organized movement for the purpose of establishing as a principle the right that the people of India, and not the people of Canada, shall have the say as to who may be accepted as citizens of Canada." Unquote. Furthermore, in a perverse synchronicity of the colonial and the anti-colonial, this logic was deployed in convergent directions by both Indian and Canadian nationalists vying for independence from the rule of the British Empire, who both began to understand sovereignty as defined by the ability to reciprocate this restrictive territorialization of the state on national grounds. Such movements became proliferate, and so the empire state died, and the nation state was born. <laughs> 
and nationalism in its contemporary border-oriented form emerged. And here's the crucial point. Not as the conclusion of any coherent political theory or philosophy or tradition, but as the afterbirth of a series of accidents and lies, quite deliberate lies. In essence, making the naive contemporary nationalist the victim of one of the greatest cons in the history of all mankind. That said, we do need to be careful, because none of this indicates that the nation-state as such doesn't exist as a real force in the world today. It certainly does. It defines the global order, and one indeed can be loyal to a nation-state. If I was forced to press a specific takeaway from the account I've given here, it would only be that, since the form of the modern nation-state is derived ultimately from a half-accidental and half-disingenuous conjunction of juridical liberalism and racism, to assume it as continuous with human behavior generally, or as a natural feature of how man relates to man, is suspect. Weber's formulation of the modern state accurately reflects current understandings underpinning the international system of states, which at least de jure equivocates sovereignty with the integrity of borders. But he and his followers err quite severely when they extend this formulation beyond the 20th century, as less than 50 years prior it was yet several degrees away from even being thinkable. This methodological nationalism, a presuming of the nation as the proper unit of analysis, infests political thinking today, both in the academy and in popular discourse. But from what we have seen, it has nothing to commend it, nothing at all. It is a mere assumption, and is responsible for a good deal of the incoherence and the mythical nature of much contemporary social thinking. That said, none of this touches on what I've called the prospective nationalist, like the eugenicist mentioned in the early part of this video, who doesn't necessarily rely on the coherence of the nation concept in history, but rather proposes nationalism on biological grounds as a pragmatically useful way to maximize the fitness of a people. In our age of information, the site of intervention is overwhelmingly intelligence. And so, in the next section, I will be addressing the question of race and IQ, and why I do not find nationalist arguments along these axes any more compelling than along appeals to the historical nation, which, as we've seen, is fictitious at best. So in the previous sections, we established that prevailing concepts of race, nation, and the territorially bounded state are all inventions, even accidents, of really quite recent history which don't reflect anything approaching something that might appropriately be called, say, the natural mode of how humans form communities. These are very contingent developments that might have been otherwise. In fact, given the vicious motives at play in their generation, one might be forgiven for insisting that they should have been otherwise, and an ideology which treats these as essential parts of the human condition and the firmest loci of group identity stands on splinter-thin stilts. Nevertheless, it may still be objected that, dishonorable as the historical roots of nationalism are, it may yet hold some utility. It may still be good for something. I'm going to argue later that this is beside the point, that the utility of nationalism is argued ultimately not because of an earnestly held belief that nationalism is useful, but that it provides therapeutic benefits for the nationalist. But in the interest of attaining to some degree of thoroughness, let's briefly address some utilitarian arguments anyway. We shall straightaway reject, for example, the notion that nationalism is useful because it arms disadvantaged groups with the conditions of political recognition in a world where methodological nationalism, i.e. an approach to politics that treats the nation as a simply given fact of the world, prevails. Yes, as a result of the great English powers abandoning liberalism to satisfy the racial prejudice of their preferred subjects, being able to demonstrate that one's group is capable of being understood as such a thing as a nation confers the immediate benefits associated with nationality under international law. To call this a good, however, conferred by nationalism, is to misconstrue the problem as the solution, because while the global adoption of methodological nationalism did open the door for oppressed groups to gain recognition as nations, it simultaneously robbed them of the ability to gain recognition for more concrete community forms, 
whose actual distinctiveness is dissolved into a nothing in the eyes not only of the law, but of their own members. Everything is flattened into a single formal type, another square on the grid. We must also reject the notion that the nation so construed confers eugenic benefits. Eugenics is a dirty word these days, and for good reason, but when some on the right, say, argue that financial aid to black communities should be slashed because the upper limits of their achievements are already predetermined by their genetic heritage, they are making an argument on the grounds of a eugenic principle, i.e., the better genes should be promoted over the worse. There are myriad reasons why this line of justification fails, but I'll go over three. First, as we've already seen, the concepts of nation-race and their unholy synthesis in the concept of the nation-state are recent contingencies not even 300 years old. The lines drawn between nations will never correspond to innate capacities or characteristics of groups, but rather to the historical situations of populations and classes over a very short time frame, so that the delineation between groups within a state, even when it evokes such intuitively obvious features as differences in skin tone, will always be arbitrarily based on historically contingent criteria. There is nothing to commend a race-based analysis over a class-based one among numerous other possible modes of classification. Second, the data on outcome disparities between these arbitrarily delineated groups within society is hopelessly fraught with conceptual and empirical difficulties. To say nothing of the glut of pseudoscientific literature that has emerged in defense of eugenics-minded policy proposals, such as incentivizing sterilization for women who score low on IQ tests, or the slashing of benefits for underperforming demographics in favor of rerouting funds to the best performing, as callous and arbitrarily classist a policy as one could suggest. Here, racial disparities in IQ test results have enjoyed the spotlight for some time, but it's possibly the most fraught of all. Even among respectable and honest scholars, there is simply no consensus on what intelligence is, and what definitions are given are extremely vague. But it gets worse than that. Even assuming we had a firmly settled concept of intelligence to work with, we have no way of determining how much of such a complex thing as intelligence is inherited and how much should be imputed to the environment. But again, it gets worse. Because even determining to a certainty that intelligence is purely inherited doesn't mean that it's inherited genetically. Social and economic conditions also propagate from one generation to the next. But it gets even worse. Because even if we knew for a certain fact that intelligence was purely a genetic inheritance, that fact alone would in no way tell us how mutable that intelligence is by environmental factors like education, nutrition, medicine, etc. Because inherited doesn't mean fixed. And yet, it still gets even worse. Because even if we proved that one's intellectual capacities were purely a genetic inheritance and inflexible after birth, this would not establish that improving the nutrition and well-being of one generation might not incur benefits on those following so that a purely inherited and generationally fixed level of intelligence might not nevertheless rise incrementally with each generation as a result of environmental factors. And lest we forget, we were only able to get to this point by making the false assumption that we even know what intelligence is in the first place. The amount of credulity it would require to take us there would, if we were consistent, have us believing in fairies long in advance. So defenses of nationalism on the grounds of eugenics, effectively, are bunk. And thirdly, even the pragmatic use of methodological nationalism by scholars of, say, international relations, ultimately confers nothing but a baked-in blindness to adjacent modes of association and power that render any purely nationalistic theory misleading at best. The nation doesn't dominate at any level of analysis, in fact, and any theory which assigns it a special status as anything more than a recent and transient historical contingency is a theory with no real scientific value. But all this is quite beside the point, because the real concern, as I indicated earlier, the real advantage conferred by the nation concept today for those who deploy it not out of urgent material necessity, as groups subject to systematic abuse and even erasure do, in order to apply for the fickle protections of international law, 
but rather as a vessel for a supposed cultural heritage and identity, ultimately has nothing to do with the eugenicists' loveless obsession with stealing from the genetically poor to give to the genetically rich, or with any practical notion whatsoever of the benefits of racial homogeneity to social cohesion, a proposal even less founded than that of the IQ fetishist. Rather, you may have noticed, as I have, that white nationalists, reactionaries, race realists, fascists, take your pick, don't usually present with the demeanor of the sober analyst forced to come to a grim conclusion by the sheer weight of empirical evidence. They are impatient romantics. They are motivated by the wish for a better world in which human action matters, in which family and community matters, in which justice accords human beings their proper dignity, and in which industry furnishes the world for mankind, not mankind for industry. They are also motivated by rage and helplessness at the fact that it appears that this can never be. Where the first reactionaries sought to quell the rising tide of the common scrum in the maintenance of a kingdom whose luster empties with one's stomach, and where the first fascists sought to match the force of man's will to that of the blind and artificial processes which had come to rule human affairs with less dignity than Frankenstein's monster, now all their ambition aspires to is isolation and a tiny, squalid autonomy. Please, big tech, let us scream voicelessly in the darkness of the internet in peace. Let us have our impotent little torch marches and park sit-outs. Let us have our cheaply bound books, our hack indie publishing companies, our badly produced indie films, and maybe, in our wildest dreams, a tiny gated community on some undesirable plot of land in the middle of nowhere. The world for these people is already gone. And this is horrible, and they're suffering because of it. And now all they want more than anything in the world is an anesthetic. At the conclusion of Carl Sagan's 1980s science documentary series Cosmos, he gave what is now a quite famous soliloquy in which he characterizes our planet, our home, our home, as a pale blue dot, a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam. As much as I can appreciate the poetry of this sentence, he was wrong. Our home is not a pale blue dot. It is a vivid and vast plain of rock cut by sea and mountain and populated by creatures and elements far more interesting and colorful than anything the heavens have yet to reveal to us. That picture of a mote of dust suspended in a sunbeam is as distant to us as Voyager 1 is, the probe which generated that picture from 4 billion miles away. No human eye has seen that dot. And behind every human eye, within every subjectivity, lies everything. Because nothing in our world is greater than a point. In a universe of practically infinite scale, size has no real significance. It's directionality, it's orientation. A butterfly flaps its wings. A single cell fails to die at the appointed time. The devil and all his angels hold congress on the head of a pin. The weakest communities are multifarious. The sovereign is singular. Our grasp on our destiny, as individuals, as communities, as a species, declines in direct proportion as human forces other than will proliferate and assert their equal rights to instruments that were meant above all to free us from the need of them. As Marx wrote of the modern condition, all that is solid melts into air. Air. A gas. An amorphous state of matter characterized by the vast separation of its particles and governed by pressure and density, which behaves in complete accordance with the properties of its container. That is, in large measure, what we have become, and the modern world we inhabit, an endless sea of conduits and basins. Human action is determined not by the dreams of geniuses nor by diligent and careful planning, but by gravity, which is why no text describes the human condition in modernity better than the Tao Te Ching. A couple fall in love, get married, have children, who move away to seek employment, sell the old family house, forget their relatives, and begin again, forgetting everyone who came before, ad infinitum. Our activities as human beings come to have the character of natural processes. Everything becomes fungible. 
Even the unique and the rare are duplicated in images sold on postcards, so that nobody really need go anywhere because there is just as much a nowhere as here. Cities. Once the loci of human deliberation and communal activity have been reduced to grids of streets. The public square, if one even exists, is a quaint relic of less significance than the signage of any stop-by convenience store or fast food joint. It is all a stop-by convenience store. Places no longer exist. There is only an endless and seemingly incomprehensible flow, and thus far we've only tamed it in our dreams. To all appearances, certainly to the perspective of the nationalist, we have made of the world a blank. Which, make no mistake, does mean that we are as free as we have ever been. But it also means that our world is effectively desolate, and we, at least as anything with a definite, non-trivial identity, are effectively dead. And when we're not drunk on something, this easily becomes unbearable. The poison of choice for the nationalist is an arbitrary line drawn around this thing called a nation. It's a flimsy sham, as we've seen, but then again, so is everything else. Every line is drawn between two arbitrary points. We need a beginning so we can postulate an end. An end so we can postulate a beginning. Why are we here? What are we here for? What are we supposed to do? Without lines, without any sort of determining limit which distinguishes that which belongs from that which doesn't, we may as well be lost in the desert without a compass. Even north is a determination of a kind, and all too often we try to ameliorate our incapacity to meaningfully comprehend or mark our environment by pretentiously referring to things like historical inevitability or human nature. Pure fictions, which only by dint of their distance appear to have the fixity and stability that we crave for things nearer by. Thomas Hobbes recognized in the 17th century the role of illusion in constituting a stable order upon which a meaningful human existence could be built. In a world where the authority of tradition from time immemorial has been thoroughly discredited, the only means by which a community of rational beings can be established is by consent. Because we don't submit to law because it is in our nature to do so, and we don't submit to law because it is given to us by God, and we certainly don't submit to law because we fear the vengeance of the dead spirits of our ancestors. We submit to law because we have consented, sometimes explicitly, sometimes tacitly, to give up our rights to some things in exchange for other things. In exchange for our total autonomy, we gain a relative degree of security on the basis of which some kind of future can be hoped for, and we are each held to our end of the bargain by the combined powers of everyone else, which appear at distance like something singular and agential, or so the story goes. And of course, government sovereignty is not singular and agential. It really doesn't even exist in an ontic way. It's just a picture. What's actually there is just a messy and always ill-defined corporation filled by ordinary and rather unintimidating individuals that bears no particular will, really, at any given time, except insofar as we find that a suitable name for whatever this lumbering, confused mass of administrators and officers and custodians ultimately ends up doing. And yet, it works, because as it turns out, a picture is all it takes to hold us all in awe, and so a lot of unhealthy, stressed-out, petty human beings come to be viewed together as the scales, teeth, and claws of a great biblical dragon, a leviathan. The point is that while nationalism, both as the fetishization of race or nation as the object of loyalty, as well as as a methodological presumption, is ultimately abortive and akin to chasing a mirage, it is nonetheless for that reason very much capable of compelling us to give chase. We are dying of thirst for the nectar that, to many at least, nationalism appears to promise. It doesn't. It leads us, in fact, it has led us, only to another desert. To precisely the same hollow, soulless, 
inhuman form from which it aspired to escape. At this point, I suppose I'm supposed to propose an alternative. I don't have one. Maybe someday I will, I'm an optimist, or maybe somebody else will. But I don't, and not for lack of trying. Perhaps there is something about the way in which human beings have categorically been folded into the resource stream of the modern world system as opposed to being in their rightful place as its honored tenants that leads any attempt to introduce an equivalent alternative at that scale at least to the same contradiction. The contradiction of consuming humanity for the cause of humanity. Because when we draw these lines between one nation and the next, between the inside of the state and the outside of the state, if we do so along lines not of practicality, i.e. what can this administrative body claim to control at a given time, but rather along lines of personal description, whether racial, religious, ideological, genetic, intellectual, what have you, what we are doing is designating those parts of humanity which may be consumed for the benefit of another chosen subsection of what really are part of that same group. We are effectively treating our own species as prey. And terrifyingly, we can do that viably. It will never produce the results that nationalists and fascists and reactionaries claim it will, but this is nevertheless a thing that we can choose to do. In fact, have chosen to do, because we're all drinking the same Kool-Aid, and there's nothing mixed into it to determine that it won't outlast the species even as a whole. We can potentially run with this for a very long time before it destroys us, Indeed, there's no promise that any alternative we may choose won't destroy us anyway, because maybe there really is no water in the desert, and all we have to decide is whether or not to chase a mirage. To quote from the author of the namesake of this channel, G.K. Chesterton, Art is limitation. So where will that limit be? Will we choose to choose a future determined consciously by us to be the most likely to be the best? Or will we wallow until the earth turns grey in the random shapes left over by an accidental spill? As always, thank you for listening, and take care.